Captain Chris German coming to you for the Charted Life Television Conversations at the Helm. And please, I apologize. I am getting over some kind of plague that my wife gave me. <laughs> and I have got the Barry White thing going on right now with my voice. But tonight we're talking about living your best life. Now, what does the Charted Life mean? And that's a brand that we came up with because we really wanted to touch into why people decide to live on their sailboats or decide to go to sea and, you know, just sail away from things. And they also you know, chose to live in their RVs or live in their buses or live in their vans or you know, travel and see the world, living the best life that they possibly can live. So that's what this show is going to be about is what is the best life and how to get the best life. And we have some really, really interesting videos to share with you. And I do hope we can have a nice conversation about this. So this is Conversations at the Helm. Jennifer, roll the tape. Hey there, this is Conversations at the Helm, and uh, I'm Captain Christopher German, and this is the Charter Life Television Network, and we are having some glitches, I think, maybe streaming out on Facebook land and YouTube land, so if you can't see us out there, that is a darn shame, because we have a phenomenal show for you tonight, and it is our goal to help you understand what is the best life? What is the charted life? And that is living deliberately. That is living, choosing to live, making your choices to go in the directions that you want to go in and make sure that you're doing the things that you need to do to live your best life. Now, there's a couple of people out there that have some different thinking on this. The, these things. Deepak Chopra is one of the videos we're going to show tonight. He says you can live forever if you just get your head in the right spot. Uh, and that is, you know, you obviously have to eat well and you have to exercise and you have to do that stuff and dr talbot i'm sorry yes you can't live on brownies but you can eat all the brownies that you want to eat and the point of this is is that you do want to eat those brownies you do want to have hot fudge sundays for dinner every once in a while you do want to kiss your wife often you do want to say i love you you do want to hop on that sailboat or hop in that rv and go explore you want to do those things that is the charted life and that's what this network is all about it's about living your best life and so the idea behind this is is that we're going to delve into that a little bit deeper and we're going to talk to some well unfortunately we're not talking to anybody tonight but if you do want to talk to us you can facebook message us uh at the charted life is our uh, facebook messenger we're not going to open up the phones tonight because it's a very difficult thing to try and get all the volumes worked out and everything like that with a system we're super as we find some sponsors to get a proper system up and running, we will absolutely have you call in more regularly. But right now, we do it on the premium. So, But if you do want to get your information to us, or if you want to comment on these videos at all, we ask you to go to The Charted Life and message us at The Charted Life on Facebook. Now, uh, we've got a couple of videos to show, and we're, while we're doing that, we're going to see if we can't get our Facebook feeds and our YouTube feeds up and working and find out what's happening with that. Um, but I I do hope that you'll enjoy a, a number of videos we have to show for you tonight. It's not all me talking tonight. It's actually going to be some really intelligent people talking about some really compelling stories. And we are going to share those stories with you tonight because that's what we can do. This is the Charted Life Television Network. I'm Captain Christopher German, but I sound like Barry White, don't I? I got that deep voice going on. Yeah, baby. Yeah. No, uh, I just have a little bit of cold going right now. Sorry about that. But uh, I I will try to clear my pipes and maybe get my normal voice back by the end of the show. But um, you're going to not have to hear this all night. We're going to protect my voice a little bit tonight. And we've got some great videos. So the first up we have is, hey, board operator, beauty of my life. What, what do we have to play for the nice folks first? 
Chopra, Deepak Chopra. This was a conference that he did out in California at the uh, University of California. And they were talking about, the title of the conference was The Atlantic Meets the Pacific. And they were talking about living life well. They had a whole bunch of different things that they were talking about there. But Deepak Chopra, he has a very interesting idea where science meets the spirituality. Um, he is a classically trained physician and he has some wonderful, insights into how to keep your brain healthy which keeps your body healthy which keeps everything going on so we're going to have Deepak Chopra and then uh, after 8 30 we've got a really cool TED talk coming up uh, it's a gentleman that traveled the world and he's got some really interesting takes on what it took to get him to travel the world and in the middle there, we have uh, another TED Talk, which is out of Harvard University. And they did a really interesting study about people living and studying who, how they lived and how they lived the good life. Um, and so I really, really can't wait to show you all these things. It is now 8.06. I've talked longer than I should. So let's go right into Mr. Chopra. And here you go. So what does that mean? The brain is a verb and not a noun. Your brain is originally created by your genes, you know, since every organ in our bodies comes from our genes. But then it is sculpted yeah. by experience. Okay, and that's all kind of experience. Right now as I'm speaking to you, your frontal cortex is being activated because your listening to me, absorbing this information, analyzing it, um, reflecting on it, hopefully. So my thoughts are influencing neural activity in your brain right now. In order to do that, I have to activate your genes because these neural networks are actually neural firings that require protein, etc. So I'm activating your genes right now in this part of your brain the frontal cortex. If we were having an emotional conversation, I would be activating your genes in a different part of the brain, the limbic brain. If it was a threatening conversation, it would be the reptilian brain, which is, feels scared. But not only am I activating your, your neural networks, you're activating mine just through your body language, okay? Because I'm trying to see how you're responding. But there are people out there watching us on television, we're activating their neural networks. So you start to realize that through the internet now we are also creating a global brain. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what is the relationship between our minds and the brain? This is, today it's in science, it's called the mind-body problem or the mind-brain problem. Does the brain produce your mind? Does the mind produce your body? Or are they both the same thing and arising from a deeper, more fundamental reality. So that's how the conversation started. Of course, everyone here, if they keep up with the literature, they're aware of the word neuroplasticity, which means you can change the structure of your brain, but if you realize it's a verb and not a noun, then you can change it by how your habits of thinking, feeling, behaving, uh, sleep, exercise, all these things influence the structure of your brain. But we are also influencing each other's brains and as a result, each other's biologies. This is ultimate interdependence. I'm actually dependent on you for my well-being and you're dependent on me, how we interact with each other. That's the basis of the book. Our next book is Super Genes because according to Rudy, who's the head of Genetics Lab, in, uh, at Mass General Hospital, uh, he says that uh, only 5% of disease-related genes are fully penetrant. I hope you understand that, that only 5% of genes are fully penetrant disease-related. So there are certain genes that predict Alzheimer's, uh, certain rare types of breast cancer, not the vast majority. The rest are influenced by what is called epigenetics, mm -hmm. which means the environment, but the environment also includes our mental environment, our mm -hmm. emotional environment. There's not a single thought that has, doesn't have a representation in the brain, 
and there's not a single event in the brain that doesn't have a representation in the body. Your genes, your neural networks, your thoughts, your emotions, your biology, your social networks, your personal relationships. In fact, the entire planet at a fundamental level is a single activity. Hey there, I'm Captain Chris German, and I'm coming to you for the Charted Life. And we really want you to know about Sarah K. Photography. She was the photographer for our wedding, and she is a phenomenal artist when it comes to camera work. And she's perfect for your uh, weddings, as you see through these photos that I'm offering right now, or uh, for your high school or graduation photos or family photos or whatever you need. So if you're looking for a great photographer in the Beaufort area, call Sarah K. Photography, 252-646-9033. What keeps us healthy and happy as we go through life? If you were going to invest now in your future best self, where would you put your time and your energy? There was a recent survey of millennials asking them what their most important life goals were, and over 80% said that a major life goal for them was to get rich, and another 50%. Of those same young adults, said that another major life goal was to become famous. <laughs> And we're constantly told to lean in to work, to push harder, <laughs> and achieve more. We're given the impression that these are the things that we need to go after in order to have a good life. Pictures of entire lives. Of the choices that people make and how those choices work out for them, those pictures are almost impossible to get. Most of what we know about human life, we know from asking people to remember the past, and as we know, hindsight is anything but 2020. We forget vast amounts of what happens to us in life, and sometimes memory is downright creative. But. What if we could watch entire lives as they unfold through time? What if we could study people from the time that they were teenagers all the way into old age to see what really keeps people happy and healthy? We did that. The Harvard study of adult development may be the longest study of adult life that's ever been done. For 75 years, we've tracked the lives of 724 men, year after year, asking about their work, their home lives, their health, and of course, asking all along the way without knowing how their life stories were going to turn out. Studies like this are exceedingly rare. Almost all projects of this kind fall apart within a decade, because. Too many people drop out of the study, or funding for the research dries up, or the researchers get distracted, or they die, and nobody moves the ball further down the field. But through a combination of luck and the persistence of several generations of researchers, this study has survived. About 60 of our original 724 men are still alive, still participating in the study. Most of them in their 90s, and we are now beginning to study the more than 2,000 children of these men, and I'm the fourth director of the study. <laughs> Since 1938, we've tracked the lives of two groups of men. The first group started in the study when they were sophomores at Harvard College. They all finished college during World War II, and then most went off to serve in the war. And the second group that we've followed was a group of boys from Boston's poorest neighborhoods, boys who were chosen for the study specifically because they were from some of the most troubled and disadvantaged families in the Boston of the 1930s. Most lived in tenements, many without hot and cold running water. When they entered the study, all of these teenagers. Were interviewed. They were given medical exams. We went to their homes and we interviewed their parents. 
And then these teenagers grew up into adults who entered all walks of life. They became factory workers and lawyers and bricklayers and doctors. One president of the United States. Some developed alcoholism. A few developed schizophrenia. Some climbed the social ladder from the bottom all the way to the very top, and some made that journey in the opposite direction. The founders of this study would never, in their wildest dreams, have imagined that I would be standing here today, 75 years later, telling you that the study still continues. Every two years, our patient and dedicated research staff calls up our men and asks them if we can send them yet one more set of questions about their lives. Many of the inner-city Boston men ask us, "Why do you keep wanting to study me? My life just isn't that interesting." The Harvard men never ask that question. <laughs> To get the clearest picture of these lives, we don't just send them questionnaires. We interview them in their living rooms. We get their medical records from their doctors. We draw their blood. We scan their brains. We talk to their children. We videotape them talking with their wives about their deepest concerns. And when, about a decade ago, we finally asked the wives if they would join us as members of the study, many of the women said, "You know, it's about time." <laughs> So what have we learned? What are the lessons that come from the tens of thousands of pages of information that we've generated on these lives? Well, the lessons aren't about wealth or fame or working harder and harder. The clearest message that we get from this 75-year study is this: good relationships keep us happier and healthier. Period. We've learned three big lessons about relationships. The first is that social connections are really good for us, and that loneliness kills. It turns out that people who are more socially connected to family, to friends, to community, are happier, they're physically healthier, and they live longer than people who are less well connected. And the experience of loneliness turns out to be toxic. People who are more isolated than they want to be from others find that they are less happy. Their health declines earlier in midlife. Their brain functioning declines sooner, and they live shorter lives than people who are not lonely. And the sad fact is that at any given time, more than one in five Americans will report that they're lonely. And we know that you can be lonely in a crowd, and you can be lonely in a marriage. So the second big lesson that we learned is that it's not just the number of friends you have, and it's not whether or not you're in a committed relationship, but it's the quality of your close relationships that matters. It turns out that living in the midst of conflict is really bad for our health. High-conflict marriages, for example, without much affection, turn out to be Very bad for our health, perhaps worse than getting divorced. And living in the midst of good, warm relationships is protective. Once we had followed our men all the way into their 80s, we wanted to look back at them at midlife, and to see if we could predict who was going to grow into a happy, healthy octogenarian, and who wasn't. And when we gathered together everything we knew about them at age 50. It wasn't their middle-aged cholesterol levels that predicted how they were going to grow old. It was how satisfied they were in their relationships. The people who were the most satisfied in their relationships at age 50 were the healthiest at age 80. And good, close relationships seem to buffer us from some of the slings and arrows of getting old. Our most happily partnered men and women. Reported in their 80s that on the days when they had more physical pain, their moods stayed just as happy. But the people who were in unhappy relationships, on the days when they reported more physical pain, it was magnified by more emotional pain.
And the third big lesson that we learn about relationships and our health is that good relationships don't just protect our bodies; they protect our brains. It turns out that being in a securely attached relationship to another person in your 80s is protective. That the people who are in relationships where they really feel they can count on the other person in times of need, those people's memories stay sharper longer. And the people in relationships where they feel they really can't count on the other one, those are the people who experience earlier memory decline. And those good relationships—they don't have to be smooth all the time. Some of our octogenarian couples could bicker with each other day in and day out, but as long as they felt that they could really count on the other when the going got tough, those arguments didn't take a toll on their memories. So. This message that good, close relationships are good for our health and well-being. This is wisdom that's as old as the hills. Why is this so hard to get and so easy to ignore? Well, we're human. What we'd really like is a quick fix, something we can get that'll make our lives good and keep them that way. Relationships are messy and they're complicated, and the The hard work of tending to family and friends—that's not sexy or glamorous. It's also lifelong; it never ends. The people in our 75-year study who were the happiest in retirement were the people who had actively worked to replace workmates with new playmates. Just like the millennials in that recent survey, many of our men, when they were starting out as young adults, really believed. That fame and wealth and high achievement were what they needed to go after to have a good life, but over and over, over these 75 years, our study has shown that the people who fared the best were the people who leaned into relationships with family, with friends, with community. So, what about you? Let's say you're 25, or you're 40, or you're 60. What might leaning into relationships even look like? Well, the possibilities are practically endless. It might be something as simple as replacing screen time with people time, or livening up a stale relationship by doing something new together, long walks or date nights, or reaching out to that family member who you haven't spoken to in years, because those all too common family feuds. Take a terrible toll on the people who hold the grudges. I'd like to close with a quote from Mark Twain. More than a century ago, he was looking back on his life, and he wrote this: "There isn't time, so brief is life, for bickerings, apologies, heart burnings, callings to account." There is only time for loving, and but an instant, so to speak, for that. The good life is built with good relationships. Thank you. And we're back. What did you think of that? That was、um, a TED talk that was given up at、uh, Massachusetts、uh, by Harvard University. It was a study that they did, and they were talking about、um, 720 young men that they got back in the 1930s,、uh, one of which was a president. And I can only suspect that that was possibly John F. Kennedy. And、uh, they followed these guys, and they followed them all the way up till now. They've been they're they're octogenarians, and they're going to be 90 soon. They're in their 90s now, and they have been following them their entire life. And the one takeaway they got for all of these guys, all of these men, was that they needed to have the personal relationships and they needed to enjoy their life. You know, and the people that had the personal relationships, even if they couldn't completely enjoy their life, even if they had their, you know, there some difficult times, they got through those difficult times because they had people that loved them. And that's one of the things that I think is so incredible about one of the particular people we have here、uh, watching on our Facebook video. Justine Yearwood just joined us on our Facebook page, and she's out there with her hubby, and they're sailing and they're going around. 
and they have a wonderful relationship. And that is what is, I think, part of the charted life, is having a proper relationship, having the love of your life with you, and going and seeing, and I'm, I'm watching this eye, as I see finally on you know, the camera over here. This is my lovely bride that's doing the board for me right here, and she is my other half to my charted life. And that's what this whole organization is about. It's about our, our loved ones. It's about the people that come to our lives, and they enrich our lives, and they make us into better people because they're there. And Justine is doing that now. She's part of Sail of Rama. Uh, and then also another, another great couple we had last week. There's a lot, yacht more to life. Cynthia and Winston Hovey. They were on last week, or two weeks ago, I guess it was. And they did, uh, they have a beautiful relationship. They've actually wandered the world and they're doing all kinds of good things together. Right now they're in an RV floating around Florida. Um, they have the book. If you want to get this book, you can get this on Amazon. There's a yacht more to life. Um, totally would recommend that you pick this up because this is one of those stories about uh, you know how they 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 overcame a bunch of hurricanes. They they went to a whole bunch of places. They got fired from a bunch of jobs together, but they stayed together together. And then it was their love that kept them going. That is what is the message that was brought about by that Harvard study. It is the the love of another keeps you going. Now, I have a particular personal side to this. I lost both my parents. My parents were divorced when I was a young kid. And um, my father was the first to go, and he was in a very loveless relationship. And uh, both he and his girlfriend passed on way too early because of their loneliness. And my mother just recently passed away a couple years ago, who was estranged from my, do my sister. Um, never got to see her grandchildren. And my mother, I think she died from loneliness too. So it does happen. You can die from loneliness. Um, the bus story. That is another great story that I really wanted to get into with this is the Walensky family. They decided they were spending too much apart from each other and they came together and they all hopped in a bus and they're traveling around now. They run a trucking company and they they are trying to live healthier, which is to say they're getting the exercise and they're going camping and hiking and all kinds of good stuff like that. But they're also together as a family. And that is the story that is going to keep them happy and healthy. Uh, as he said in the video, it wasn't about their cholesterol when they're 50. It wasn't about whether they liked their jobs. It wasn't about whether they, you know, had the perfect life. It was about the fact that they had someone to love them. And that family lovingness, that is what is part of the charted life. Mind, body, and soul. Now, the video before that, the Deepak Chopra uh, video, that one was, I think, incredibly interesting because that video talks about the brain and the genetic mutations that take place when you are in a negative situation. Now, if you hate your job and you hate your sticks and bricks life and you hate the those things. These are the things that are going to make you die sooner. So if you want to hit the road and get in your bus and travel across the country, or you want to hit the, you want to restore a sailboat and sail the Great Loop, or you want to you want to do these things, don't just watch the videos about these things. Certainly watch the videos about these things, because we got a great lot. Of, hopefully we give you the inspiration to do it. But at the same time, we also want you to go out and do these things. And we're trying to inspire people to live the mobile life lifestyle because we think that is one of the best ways to live the good life, live the best life, live the life that is deliberate, live the charted life. Now, I have a uh, time clock that I got to pay attention to here, and we're coming up on the bottom of the hour. Uh, we're going to do one more video, and um, the folks out on YouTube land, we apparently stepped on some toes in YouTube, and they, they yelled at us about stuff, but forget YouTube. You can see the stuff on Facebook, and you can see it on Roku, Apple TV, Chromecast TV, Fire Stick TV and Android TV. Now, it says it's just about 8.30, and we are going to take a quick little break, and there's some very compelling content that you have to watch about advertising on this, and we have to pay some bills, so please listen to the, the commercials because we need your support. But let's fire off those commercials, and then we'll come back and we'll talk a bit more. I'm Captain Chris German. Thank you so much for watching the first half hour of Conversations at the Helm. And without further ado, Jennifer, roll the tape. Good evening.
Christopher Sherman for the Jar Life Television Network. We are going out to 380 million people around the world, and you should be advertising with us. If you'd like to advertise with us, you should call us at 252-617-3792. And if you call today, we will give you all kinds of good benefits, like reaching people as far away as Australia, and going out all hours of the day, giving you over 200 plays of your advertisement per month, and of course, coming alongside some of the great programmers like S.V. Pelos, Lance with Alaskan Local Music, Rabbi, Manus Friedman, and all the other assorted programming we offer on the Charted Life Television. So if you want to, call us at 252-617-3792, and get yourself on the Charted Life Television Network. Work. Welcome to Alaska Local Music. I'm here. I'm Lance here with Chris Talley. How's it going, Lance? You know, What's going on? What, what are you into? And he's like, I'm actually a rapper. And I was like, oh, snap. That's yeah. dope. Because... Yeah, I've seen that whole thing. You know, it's great to have someone that supports you and be behind you. Oh, yeah. Yep, exactly. Let's say we all have a normal life. We are educated, we have a job, a bunch of friends, and once or twice a year, we go on vacation. But once a while, on a Sunday night, we lie in our bed, and just before we fall asleep, how many of you sometimes think, ah, oh, damn, I don't want to work tomorrow? And once in a while, on a Sunday night, we lie in our bed, and we ask ourselves, that's all? Is that really everything? Come on, there must be more in life for me. How many of you had those thoughts before? Thank you. And how many of you want to learn some, to some tools how to actually get or to reach that more in life? All right, thank you very much. My topic today is how to live life to the fullest by simply adopting some really easy mindset skills, which, by the way, are going to have a huge impact on your personal life. I feel really honored to have this opportunity to talk in front of you today, so thank you so much for it. In the next couple of minutes, we're going to figure out how some really easy mind, mind shifts can transform everybody's life. Those life hacks used in the correct way can turn everybody's life into a 24-7 party all year long. It can boost your business, your income, it helps you to get shit done, and it can also shift your relationship with your loved ones onto the next level. I'm 31 years old, and for the past seven years, I've traveled around the world. I spent most of my 20s exploring close to 70 countries. On my trips, I came in contact with a variety of people from all over the world. These people had different backgrounds, religions, grew up in different circumstances, and they all had their personal story in life. Traveling is also the reason how I got to know my girlfriend, and for the past four years, we've traveled together on this beautiful and mesmerizing planet. But before all of that, I was a different person, and therefore I want to tell you a story. Yeah, you can actually laugh, but this is me, <laughs> back in 2009. I had a normal life, I had a job, I sold business software, I worked nine to five, uh, my income was okay, and I had an own business car, an Audi A3 sports bag. Big rims, very fast, and a cool sound system. Back then, I was, I was pretty materialistic, and I had a shiny career ahead of me. But then, in March 2009, something happened. I went on my annual leave, and I flew to New Zealand, to the other side of the world. And back in Europe, which is in March, the peak season of being winter-depressed, and you know, you walk along the streets, and it's gray, and it's rainy, and it's cold, and 
you know, people just walk around like zombies, they're afraid to show you the teeth, and you actually have to turn them around to make them smile. <laughs> But I was in New Zealand on the other side of the world, it was summer, it was 25 degrees, and on my first day I rented a camper, and I drove along the coast, and I came across a beautiful beach, and I thought, hey, I want to stay there for the night. So I pulled over, And I opened up the trunk, put down two chairs, one table, a bottle of red wine, and I eventually started to prepare my dinner. And then a couple of other backpackers joined me, and we had this really amazing and cozy, beautiful uh, get-together right on the shoreline, sitting in front of a bonfire. And when you travel, there is always, always this one guy who's able to play Wonderwall from Oasis on a guitar. <laughs> It's always like that. And when I went to bed, something crazy happened. While I was lying on the back of my camper van, I fell asleep to the sound of the ocean. I had this huge smile on my face. And I was just happy. I just lived in that moment. And the next morning, something even more crazy happened. I woke up, and I still had this smile on my face. And this went on for three weeks, the whole time I was in New Zealand. And it was, it was just amazing, like all the, all the people I met, all the experience, all the adventures I lived through, it was, or even like the landscape in New Zealand, it was just breathtaking. When I got back home, something changed. I could actually see my life lying down in front of me, like on railways. You know, if I go along, you can see more money, more money coming in, bigger promotions, bigger cars. And I asked myself, That's all? Is that really everything? Come on, there must be more in life for me. And I started to get scared of that thought of being 60 or 70 years old and looking back on my life and the only thing I've done was chasing digital numbers on my bank account. And I started to realize there's so much more out there, so much more to explore, so much more than just work nine to five. So I decided to change my life. When I decided to quit my job, the feedback of my social environment was not as positive as you might think. There was nobody waiting around the corner telling me, you know, Nick, oh my God, this is awesome, congratulations to give me a high five. No, people judged me. People asked me, are you stupid? You're throwing away your career, your safe job. You should take care about your retirement plan. But instead, you just walk away from your responsibilities just to travel. I had a lot of doubts about my decision. I was scared. I actually got poisoned by the fear and thoughts of others. Today, when I look back, and I can say that with 100% guarantee, to change my old life, it was the best decision I ever made. And this is why I'm here today, to show you how important it is to listen to your own heart, to live life to the fullest, on your full potential, and eventually create a life you always dreamt of. By simply adopting the following attitudes, I got taught, during my adventures around the world. When people ask me, how do I finance my travels, and I got this question asked a lot, I used to answer, oh, well, I don't have to take care about money because I got really rich parents. And that was the exact same reaction all the time. 1% was like smiling or laughing, and 99% were sitting there and probably thought, hmm, what an idiot. <laughs> But the truth is, I don't have rich parents. I finance it by myself. But the most important thing is you need to feel that burning desire. You need to be convinced that it's going to work out just fine in the end. The most important thing to achieve your goal is the, right, is, is the right mindset to it in the first place. When your energy flows on a certain level, out of nowhere, suddenly, there will be new opportunities. You're going to meet new people. You change your priorities. It's called the law of attraction. When I decided to travel the world, I didn't have the enough money to do so, but I was working nine to five, and I actually got changed in the toilet of my office in a bartending outfit to go and do bartending jobs until 2 a.m. in the morning. Or when I was in Australia and I got dropped and I had $40 left in my account. But my, my, my dream was still so big to continue to travel, so I found myself five jobs at the same time. I worked 16 hours a day, seven days a week, for three months straight, and yes, it was busy. And yes, it was stressful, but it didn't feel like that. Actually, it just felt like another step closer to continue to travel, to continue to pursue my dream. So this is why it's so important in the first place. It's all about the mindset. When I went to Mexico, 
I, my Spanish skills were pretty limited. I could tell a girl that she has beautiful eyes and I could order a beer. That's it. I know a couple of you might think, oh, well, that should be enough. But I really wanted to dig in deep, so I signed up for a language course and I had this amazing opportunity to stay with a, with a, with a guest family. And my guest mom, Juanita, she was such a lovely woman. And after three days, I thought my Spanish skills improved big time. So after school, we sat down, we had lunch together, me and my guest mom, and we ate a delicious soup. And then I started to talk to her in Spanish. And I told her, you know, about my family back home, about my passion for cooking. And then I told her that I actually already got better cooking skills than my mom. And then she suddenly, she stood off and she was kind of pissed off. And she walked to her room and she slammed the door. And I was sitting in front of my soup and I had no clue what was going on. The next day, when I explained this whole situation at my teacher, she actually cried because of laughing so much. And then we, together we figured out that the day before, I haven't had told Juanita that my cooking skills were better than my mom's. I actually told her right in her face, Juanita, my cooking skills are better than your mom's. <laughs> Since that moment, I know that Mexicans doesn't like your mama jokes. <laughs> But don't be afraid of making mistakes. Gain, gain, like, learn from them, gain experience. Making a mistake out of a lack of knowledge is as normal as learning to walk. If you fall down, just get up and try again. Making mistakes is the greatest source of knowledge you will ever have, followed by Google. <laughs> But if I would be scared to make mistakes, learning a new language, I couldn't be bothered to talk at all because I was making mistakes in every single sentence. But because I learned from them, after six weeks, I was almost able to have just about a normal conversation with people from Argentina, with people I could never, ever talk to before in my entire life. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Traveling is not just about surfing, soaking up the sun, drinking mojito in your board shorts at the beach. I spent a lot of time on my, on my own while I was traveling, and I worried, I thought about everything, about my life, what I wanted to pursue, and I started to compare myself. I started to compare myself with people who were further than me, who were more successful, who seemed to figure out their whole perfect life. But to be honest, everybody has to walk their own path in life. Sometimes you're ahead, sometimes you're behind, and the race is long. And in the end, it's only with yourself. So don't compare yourself. Take people as an, as an inspiration, as an example. Learn from their mistakes. But don't compare yourself. You have to walk your own path. If you do so, something extraordinary is going to happen. In the end, you suddenly you don't see yourself in a big competition anymore. You're actually going to be happy for people when they achieve something. You don't stress yourself too much anymore. You actually use your energy to get ahead in your own life with your own speed instead of worrying or being envious about others. We all have at least two things in common here. Number one is we all have dreams and goals. It doesn't matter if they're personal or business related. And the second thing is, we all had at least this one situation where we did not make this one necessary step to get ahead to pursue our dreams out of fear. The fear of what other people might think about it. How many of you in this room deeply, really deeply care about my personal dreams and goals? Do you see? Oh, you do? Thank you, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. No, but the truth is, nobody gives a shit. In a certain way, we're all selfish. When it comes to our own dreams and, 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 and goals, we just care about ourselves. Yes, maybe people have an opinion about it or trash talk about it for a minute. But in the end, nobody gives a shit. So if you want to travel the world, or if you want to create a business, or if you want to improve your skills or whatsoever, go for it. Don't be afraid of what other people might think about it. When I traveled in the States, I met this one girl from Eastern Europe, and her dream was to become a professional photographer. And to do so back home in her own home country, there were no opportunities to do so. So she went to the States, and she offered herself as an unpaid trainee to gain experience in the photo sector. And during nights, she worked night shifts as a waitress to make some money to afford some other course to attend. And all her friends, they thought, oh, she's going to be crazy, that her idea were nuts, that she's going to fail. But this girl, she just did not give a shit about other opinions. And today, you can actually see herself, or you can see her photos covering magazines and commercials all over the world. So don't be afraid to pursue your dreams.
because of the fear what other people might think about it. Embrace yourself. Get to know yourself. And finally, fall in love with yourself. It has nothing to do with, with being conceited or cocky, and you actually don't have to wear a cape to be your own superhero, because your superpower is to be responsible. When I decided to travel the world, I took that responsibility, because I learned I'm the only one who is in charge for it. So, all those, like, sometimes, like, in the first place, I was, I was quite scared of taking that responsibility, because I could not blame anybody else anymore for anything in my life. And actually, we are really good in blaming others. We use them as an excuse to not go out of our comfort zone. But after a while, it felt like a relief, because I got to choose who is going to be the captain of my own lifeboat, and it was me. So all those attitudes combined, we just heard, combined, is going to lead to this, to be your own superhero, to take that responsibility. And finally, There's one more really important lesson I learned. I mean, I went through some really crazy shit the past couple of years. If it was having a fear of death experience while I was sailing on a catamaran through a hurricane, or when I was standing on a beach in, in Fiji and somebody actually shot me with a spear gun through my thumb in my chest by accident, or when I got dropped or I could see myself in places where I had no place to sleep. But to be honest, I, I don't want to miss out a single experience out of those, because those situations taught me the most important lesson, to be grateful, to not take anything for granted, to appreciate all the small things in life, to sit here, to listen, to read. In the beginning I said we all have a normal life, like to be educated, to have a job, to have a bunch of friends, to go on vacation once or twice a year. This is not a normal life. We all live an extraordinary life. We are so privileged. We have shelter, we have, we have food, we have water, we have peace. But all those impressions, all those learnings, all those experiences and adventures during my trips taught me so much about the true value of life. Life is, life is not there just to chase digital numbers on your bank account. Life is there to be lived to the fullest with your own true potential and a smile on your face. So the next time you're going to lie down in your bed on a Sunday night and you think, is that really everything? Deep inside, you already know the answer. Just listen to your heart and go get it. Thank you very much. And we're back. Yes. What did you think of that guy? That was Nick uh, Martin, and he is uh, a world traveler. He's been to more than 70 different countries, or just under 70 different countries, and he's been on catamarans, he's been on planes, he's been on buses, he's been on everything, and he's managed to wander all around, and he had some nice takeaways. And I, the reason why I, was, I wanted to add include that video was because that kind of brings, I think, the whole thing back together. Um, Deepak Chopra talks about having the, the, the brain in a good place to, with good people, with good experiences, because you absorb the energies of those things, and that affects the genetics and the biometrics of your body. And then we moved on to... Um, Who was that other guy? Uh, wow, well, the Harvard study of the gentlemen, uh, 720 gentlemen that were studied their entire lives. And they, turns out, you know, it was pretty empirical that, you know, if you're going to enjoy your life, you're going to live longer. Now, that's not a brain teaser. That's not, everybody gets that, you know. People understand that inherently. But it's really been proven now in science that if you want to live 
a good life, you want to live long time, you have to take care of not just your body and not just your mind and not just your spirit, but all three of them. And that's what the Charted Life Television Network is about. And that's what the Charted Life is about. And we're looking for members that want to live that way with us. Now, there's four tenets that we've added to this thing. Life is the first tenet. You have to have life. Spirituality is another one. Adventure is another one. And enjoyment is the last. Those are the four tenets of the charted life. And we believe, uh, Jennifer and I, we're the, the two members right now, that we, we really want people to live this life. Excuse me, one sec. Okay, I'm going to try to finish this. I told you I have the plague, and I, oh, I live, live the charted life, or I try to. <coughs> I, I'm having a difficulty trying to do this. Recyclable water bottle. Be, ban the bag. Ban the bag. Oh, yeah. That's, Mark, um, what was his name? Uh, Rubio. Marco Rubio? Is that his name? The guy with the horrible uh, oh, the water, the water bottle. bottle. Yeah, I had that too. Sorry about that, folks. Well, uh, if you're on Facebook right now and you're watching this thing, shoot us a comment. Tell us what you think. Do you think this is junk science? Do you think that this is, uh, you know, just, just chutzpah? Uh, or is it really true? And that's where we're taking our programming on this. We have some really great creative content providers that are powering this channel right now. We have SV Delos, that is the granddaddy of all of this, the sailing television people. We also have the bus story, which is the Wilinski clan, and they are wandering around the West right now and uh, doing their thing in their converted school bus, but they decided to come together as a family. Um, even with S.V. Delos, I mean, it's it, he's, he's married, his wife is out there with his wife. He met his wife on the boat. His brother's with him on the boat. It's a, it's a family thing that they're doing on that boat. Same thing with the Wilinskis, family thing on that bus. Roll with it. That's another program we have on there. It's a couple. They're wandering around out there. <coughs> Sorry. And then, of course, um, there is Sailo Rama, which Justine and uh, her, what, what's Justine's? Robbie. Robbie, that's it. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm dying here. Justine and Robbie, they are a beautiful couple. I love talking with them. We got to talk to them over at the Annapolis Boat Show, and they're just such fun people to be around. If they ever make it to Beaufort, we're going to have them over dinner or something like that. Speaking of couples we have to have over dinner, let's talk about the Hovies, Winston and Cynthia Hovey, authors of There's a Yacht More to Life. They were on two weeks ago. They're watching tonight, I think, wherever they may be, someplace down on the space coast of Florida. But they've been doing this mobile lifestyle their entire lives and they're now in an RV traveling around uh, Florida and they're doing the whole charted life thing that is why they get to enjoy their life so much so you should enjoy your life that much if you're not hitting the bricks and or not going out and seeing you know the sailboating life and stuff like that that's you don't have to do that but maybe take your weekends and go sail on the weekends with your family maybe you know go rent an rv <coughs> i'm getting yelled at for the hand sorry um, but that's the whole purpose of the charted life. And I'm wishing I didn't have the plague and I could say this in a much more co coherent way and I wasn't hacking my brains out. But, uh, you know, I, I think that is one of the beauty of these things. And that's why Jennifer and I are officially the mascots of the charted life with our dogs, because that is the charted life. It is a life lived deliberately. It is a life lived enjoyably, adventurously, and spiritually. And that is is the mobile lifestyle as far as i can tell so uh we're coming right up against on time i want to get one more message in there because ban the bag and beaufort was last week's show and not enough people caught that video so we're going to air that video one more time but we're going to close the show a little early today but i do shoot me an email at info at the charted life net if you want to learn more about this mo this charted life thing and if you would not like to do that, you can call. 252-617-3792 is my phone number. You can get my cell phone directly. If you're interested in advertising on this, call that number too. <coughs> oh, I'm dying. Jennifer, please give me some respite here. Let me get out of this show. <laughs> I gotta go home and take some cold medicine. So, uh, but... That is the charted life. So thank you so much for watching this week. We're going to rebroadcast this thing because we messed up. 
I, 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 I don't know what happened. I put the, the link in wrong and it didn't stream properly to Facebook and YouTube. So we're going to redo this thing and we're going to rebroadcast it Sunday nights at 8 p.m. And I have now officially gotten the high sign. We can call it a day. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, Mr. and Mrs. America, all the ships at sea, thank you so much for watching Conversations at the Helm. I'm Captain Christopher German, and next week I'll be back, but I won't have this horrible cough. <coughs> thank you for watching. Have yourselves a wonderful week. Talk to you soon. 539, time for an other news stories that are maybe gonna shock you into life on this hump day. An American diver broke the record for deepest submarine dive ever. He says he found new species and plastic bags and candy wrappers. One of those plastic bags was just lying on the ocean floor seven miles down. As we drag our bins out for collection, it makes us feel like we're helping the environment. But there's a problem. We're being conned. Temporary closure of Boroke, which has been called a cesspool, and disturbing videos and images of plastic-filled Bali have been emerging after authorities declared a garbage emergency. It's an atrocity that even the most remote places on our planet are now filled with the testimony of our filthy habits. The plastic pollution problem seems to be a never-ending problem with no solution. But the truth of the matter is, is it's a matter of public knowledge that when we get together as a human people, we can do amazing things. We are proposing with Ban the Bag and Beaufort that we work together as a community, as a people, to ban our world of these problems by taking responsibility for these problems. We propose that by working together as a community, we can take personal responsibility for this problem and stop using these products at the source of them where we use them and consume them, and instead convince our business community and our political leaders that they don't have to take action because we will do it for them. It is our hope that by raising awareness of this problem in our local and state and national community, we can convince people to refuse these usage of these products so that when they come to the store or they go to the restaurants or they go wherever they may be in their daily life and they see plastics, they may choose an alternative. And by reducing the demand for these products, we hope we might convince the world that we no longer need these products. Not so long ago, America was faced with the idea that they were going to have to give up tuna. It seemed that tuna nets were incapable of deciphering between tuna and dolphin, and thousands of dolphin were being killed every year in the pursuit of that tuna fish sandwich. Americans couldn't live for themselves, and so they went to the store and they stopped buying tuna. The tuna industry very quickly decided that they had to change their practices, and it was very soon thereafter that dolphin safe tuna was brought to the market and the dolphin population rebounded. That is the mechanism we're hoping we can tap into to get plastics removed from our lexicon. By reducing and eliminating consumer demand for plastics, we will have a massive effect on the economic base of these products and thereby reducing the use of these products and the supporting industries that make these products available to us. We can change America just by refusing usage of these products in our homes. And it is our hope that Ban the Bag in Beaufort and beyond will convince you to stop using single-use plastics in your home so that we may have a global effect. You can help this effort in any number of ways by refusing styrofoam containers or simply changing the way that you do business as a small business owner. All of these efforts are appreciated and needed, but we also ask that you help support our efforts financially. And you can send your contributions to Ban the Bag in Beaufort and beyond, care of the charted life, 209 North 35th Street, Moorhead City, North Carolina. Thank you so much for all that you do, and God bless our planet. In Iac and let's get away from it all. Let's take a trip and a trailer. 
No need to come back at all. Let's take a powder for Boston or Tatter and let's get away from it all.